It's lovely. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. We have our very special guest in the studio. I'll introduce him in a few moments. I hope you all had a wonderful Purim Chag Sameach, enjoyed the Hamatashen and all the different uh, Seudas, reading of the Megillah, etc. And don't forget, now exactly five weeks' time will be a Pesach. And in a few weeks, I'm going to have some wonderful recipes to give out for Pesach and some special guests as well. Now, as usual, we do start off with, unfortunately, those who passed away. And there was a very, very sad one last uh, Wednesday. That was of Dayan Rabbi Dr. Dennis Isaacs. That's dear David Meyer Ben Yishak, who passed away after a very long illness at the age of 84. I did speak about him last Friday morning, and there is an obituary which will appear in this week's uh, Jewish report. There was also Philip Shaw, the brother of Rabbi David Shaw. He is the associate rabbi of St. Beth Medish HaGodel as well. And there was Stanley Morris Goldstein, Edith uh, Helen uh, Lehman, Eva Kahn, uh, Morris Bilchik, Mary Feinberg, I must mention her, she was 102 years old. And then Max, M- Mackie Brody, uh, the um, past chairman and the honorary vice president of the Witz Hebrew Benevolent, today known as the Jewish Loan Society, Free Loan Society, Edith Weinberg, Maya Chafkin, and Regina Rom. So we want to wish all the respective families Chaim Arukim, a long and a good laugh, and may they have no further sorrow. On a very, very happy note, I want to um, wish a hearty muzzle talk to Jeff and Margalit Kaplan on the birth of a grandson, to Aaron and Dina Ni Wallowitz, the birth of a son, and as we say, please God, Lechupa Masim Toy Evim. Now, I've got in the studio with me this evening. Uh, Jono uh, David, I'm sure many of you remember, he was on the air last year, it was August, we spoke about all his travels, he's been to 130 countries in the world, taking photographs of various shuls, uh, cemeteries, or anything of any Jewish interest, and uh, welcome uh, Jonah, it's a pleasure seeing you again, I know you've just been to North Africa You'll tell us all about it. But just for our listeners who are tuned in for the first time, give us a background, how you got involved, and uh, where you've been. Just a brief history there. Oh, good evening. It's good to be back. Um, how did I get into it? I um, love to travel, and um, my interests gravitated towards the Jewish photography because I always enjoyed visiting um, Jewish communities and feeling welcome in, the, in these places that I wasn't familiar with. Um, and over the, over time, that travel became more meaningful to me than uh, just being a tourist and going from one tourist site to another. So it was a progression over time, and um, it's become a central part of my life because uh, it's important. Uh, it'll be something I'll leave behind, and uh, it gives purpose to my travel and, uh, as I said, is a center of my life. So it's really something that uh, I center all my travel around. It dictates um, wh- where I go, what I do, and, and ultimately who I meet. And um, I really can't imagine my life without it uh, at this point. So um, I started on Jewish Africa uh, in August 2012, and uh, I have now been to 14 of the anticipated 30, 32 uh, countries that I would like to go to ideally for this project. So this trip that I'm currently winding down in a couple of weeks um, is basically the midway point. So when I started out in August 2012, I really thought, wow, this is pretty audacious of me to set out such a large um, project. Uh, I kicked it off quite successfully here, mainly in South Africa and met a lot of people, got a lot of photos, and it was great. And then I came back and carried on and went to a few more countries. And now I hear I'm at the halfway point, and I, I just feel like, you know, wow, I'm not just doing it. I'm going to do it and finish this thing. And so, um, yeah, I'm excited to what lies ahead. Um, the challenges get a little bigger from here, I think, because uh, – uh, the southern region of Africa is generally the easier part. It's infrastructurally easier to get around. Uh, language-wise, English is more widely spoken. Um, 
Uh, I speak Spanish. I can get by on. Japanese doesn't take me very far. Uh, I live in Japan, so I've learned Japanese. Um, but that doesn't help me here in, in Africa anywhere. And uh, so as I head out to Western and Northern Africa, uh, I face different challenges. So uh, I have a few worry spots there as well for security and such, uh, like, for example, in Nigeria. But uh, we're, uh, I'll, I'll really worry about that when the time comes. And uh, tell me, John, and do you, are you welcome there when you come? Or do you feel uh, a little bit tension or the – Welcome bit, by the community? Well, the community. Or, oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. There are – a lot of these communities, for example, in Ghana or Cameroon, where I was just recently, uh, they're eager to have as many outsiders, uh, Jewish, of course, uh, coming and visiting and um, helping them in, in, in any aspect uh, that, that people can, um, from religious support to spiritual support to cultural support to just getting them connected and getting their message out to uh, the wider audience so that uh, they're known. So, but I, what I yeah. meant is also the authorities. When you know you come with a – what passport do you hold, a British or American? I tr well, I travel on a British passport, but I have an American passport as well. Well, uh, well <laughs> I don't uh, go in announcing that I'm there for that specific purpose. Right. Uh, I'm not doing this as a business per se, so I'm not a business traveler right. and uh, – so I'm there really as a tourist who just happens to be taking pictures of Jewish communities. So. Oh, right, right. But uh, I haven't come up uh, against any um, uh, issue in that regard. Right. Um, funnily enough, um, it seems like in the DRC, uh, Cameroon, and in Ghana, you know, I would see the odd Israeli flag in a taxi or – Israel on the, on the back of the, uh, of a bus or something, and uh, for uh, I don't know, I, I couldn't quite get get an answer to it. But there seems to be an affinity for Israel and Jews in in some of these areas. So um, no, it doesn't seem as though anybody's out to get me. If there's any questions or any uh, comments you want to put to uh, to Jono, please SMS three four five one nine. I'm sure he'll be able to answer your. Your, your queries. So, uh, Jonah, just tell us, your, uh, before you went to Africa now, what were some of the countries, some of the highlights where you've been in, say, Europe or uh, South America, have you been there at all? I have been in South America, yeah, but my work uh, has not, uh, doesn't really merit talking about <laughs> right down there. It's some of the, some of my older travel, really, before I got into uh, the depth of the commitment of the work that I do now, and also my photographic skills were inferior. So although those photos uh, are on my website because that's all I have to represent those particular places that I've been to, um, I'm not encouraging anybody to go to my right. website and necessarily look at those, with exception perhaps in Suriname in northern um, South America uh, and some places around the Caribbean. Um, but yeah, places like um, Chile, uh, you know, no, nothing to nothing to look at there. But in Argentina, there's a very, very big, strong Jewish yeah, community. Yeah, I've been in Argentina, but uh, I, I didn't do any Jewish photo work at that time. It was and quite in, a long, long time ago. And in Buenos Aires? Yeah, of course. That's where the community yes. mainly rests. And so, Brazil? Uh, well, Brazil, uh, again, let's see. I went to Brazil in 1988. Okay, I was on a university break. This is a million years ago, so this is long before I even had the inkling of doing what I'm doing now. And I went uh, into the Amazon. I went to a place called Manaus, and I went to a synagogue there with a friend of mine who was studying in Argentina at the time. She's American, but we traveled together. And I wrote a story about it uh, that was ultimately published in a Jewish paper in the U.K., and just to show – just to tell you how great my photos were, they ran the story without any photos. So <laughs> so uh, in a sense, in a very remote sense, uh, they, that is how it all started. The sort of the seed was planted. And then later, I kind of in my mind went back to that event several years later. I mean not just a year or two but several years later when I thought about my experience and the, the idea of being in this far-flung place, feeling welcome – Feeling familiar inside, but everything outside the synagogue and around feeling uh, completely foreign, um, you know, a stranger in a strange land. And having written a story that was published and seeing my name in print and, you know, and all of that was exciting. So those were early things which uh, propelled me to move forward. So in a, in, like I said, in a kind of a remote way, that experience was uh, sort of the beginnings the early seedlings of my Jewish photo life that I have now. Right. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back in a few moments. 
What's going on in the community? Let's find out with Isaac Resnick. You're listening to Talk of the Town with Isaac Resnick on 101.9 High FM. Welcome back, 12 minutes past seven. If you just tuned in, we have in the studio with us this evening Jonah David. I'm sure many of you remember we had him here last year in August speaking about all his world travels, going around the world, taking photographs of old uh, Jewish synagogues, cemeteries, etc., Jewish communities in very exotic places. Now, Jonah, just tell us a little bit about your background, where you started, where you, where you were educated, and uh, what really got you into this? Uh, well, I was born in the UK, uh, but I grew up in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. That's how I have the British passport that I mentioned, and, uh, of course, the American passport. Uh, but I haven't lived in the States for nearly 25 years. I've been in Japan, Osaka, Japan, for the last 20. I was in London um, for four years uh, before that. And um, I somehow, during my time in England, developed an interest in living in Japan, and I ultimately followed that dream, that interest. And I went out there, and I ended up working in uh, university, which um, has afforded me uh, this life because it's given me enough of an income to support my life and the travel life. So I have this kind of double life, if you will. And, you know, with so much, I have upwards of four months of holiday time a year uh, off. Uh, so I need to fill it with something. <laughs> and I uh, originally, initially in the early years in, in Japan, was just really doing the tourist thing and going here and there and throwing a dart at the map and having that you know, lucky to be able to live like that, and I went wherever I wanted during my holidays. Uh, but as I said, um, I gravitated towards uh, the Jewish communities as just sort of a point of familiarity, and it just grew from there. And um, I just found that taking the photographs and creating a, a collection was valuable. Uh, and then about, oh, I don't remember, seven, eight years ago, uh, the switch really flipped, and I established my website, jewishphotolibrary.com, and um, I, that also uh, put me, uh, gave me a lot of energy to fill that website with as much uh, work as I could. So that's really how it all started. Um, it wasn't waking up one day and just deciding, hey, I'd like to do this. It was a progression. Uh, but as also, as I said a, a few moments ago, I, I just can't now imagine my life not doing this. Now, uh, what yeah. background? Have, did you have a Jewish background in Washington when you were growing up? Well, I up? grew up in a conservative um, household, and uh, I was uh, a bar mitzvah and did all the expected things, you right. know. But um, my life today uh, doesn't necessarily follow in that same sort of path. Um, really, the motive behind my work, in in a, in, uh, in 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 the sense of uh, what drives me. Uh, is is more from a cultural and historical perspective of things, uh, not the religious side of things. Although, of course, it's all you know rolled into one. But. Yes, correct. Mm. And one other thing. Now, you say you lecture at a university in Japan. Yeah. So, have you got a, a degree, a college degree, or? I have. Well, I have an undergraduate degree in English, and I have a master's degree in in uh, also in English language, uh, which I took from. Uh, the University of London. And University you say College. you lecture in uh, English language or what? Yeah, I teach various aspects of English language uh, skills and uh, and whatnot at right. uh, uh, three different universities in, in Osaka, Japan. Uh, Osaka, mm. right. Now, just tell us now about the latest trip now. We'll come back a little later to the others. Now, you've been to Africa because when you were here in August last, you told us you were going to go to, mm. to Ghana and you were going to go to... No, that, that was this trip. This trip last yes, trip in August... Uh, I was in uh, Swazi, Swaziland, Botswana, oh, yes, Swazi, here, of course, in yes. South Africa, um, Kenya, Uganda. Uh, where else did I go? <laughs> Uganda, uh, Kenya must yeah. find a, a, quite a big Jewish community there. There's a well, lot of Israelis. Right. Yeah, but uh, there's communities in Kenya today, you know, in, in uh, Nairobi, for, for instance. It, they're not what they used to be. They, they you know. used to be a very they, they, big they, community. Yeah, the heydays, you know, they're yes. gone for a lot of the communities throughout the region um, for various reasons. But the threads that they do have there, the people that they do have there are vibrant and they're active. And, uh, 
And uh, the, the Nairobi synagogue, for instance, was uh, oh a year or so ago, was beautifully restored. So there's obviously uh, f- uh, financial buoyancy and uh, interest in keeping to keep it going for sure. Correct. So uh, that's always very pleasing to see that as opposed to the opposite side where you go to places and unfortunately synagogues and cemeteries are falling apart and nobody's there to take care of them. And, you know, so yeah. it's, it's nice. And in Uganda? Uganda, um, there is, uh, well, I should mention first, there is Chabad uh, representation in in, uh, Kampala. I did not go there, uh, really, because I simply didn't know about it being there. Um, But I went to go to the Abayudaya community, uh, which some people who are listening, uh, I'm sure, have heard of. They are um, a, a black Jewish community. They their roots go back about a hundred and plus a few years, hundred and ten five years something, um, and they have over the years uh, become officially recognized and converted Jewish at a conservative level. Um, I believe I don't want to uh, put out misinformation, but from what I understand, there are there, there are various villages. Uh, there are nine I think villages of the Ab- Abayudaya. Um, they're in the mostly in the eastern part of the country, and not too far from a, a, a town called Mabale. And there's a principal village where the only ordained rabbi lives. And then there's uh, several other villages. And there are uh, two or three of them, I believe, are um, regard themselves as orthodox. And the rabbi was trained at a conservative level. He went to uh, rabbinical school in Los Angeles. And uh, I understand that there's a push now in the community to to, to be uh, converted ortho, uh, orthodox, become orthodox. To, be, to be fully recognized uh, at all levels. So, right. uh, but where that stands in their own um, um, situation and um, how they're going to go about that, I, those ins and outs, I, I have no idea. Right now, this this new trip, the latest now. You said, okay, you did Botswana and you did Swaziland. We'll come to that later. So you went to Ghana. Yeah. You went to Cameroon. Mm-hmm. Uh, where else uh, you say? DRC. DRC. Yeah. And Rwanda. And Rwanda. And, of course, time here again in South Africa. And yeah. South Africa. Now, let's, let's start there. Let's t- talk about Ghana. Mm-hmm. Where were you in Ghana? What did you find there? Uh, there, there's one small community of 40, 50 people. Uh, they call themselves the House of uh, Israel. And they reside in a village about three hours uh, outside of a town called Kumasi, which is a few hours, uh, sorry, a 45-minute flight from Accra, the capital. Uh, or another way of looking at it is not, about a nine-hour bus journey from Accra to their village. And um, they are completely unrecognized in any, by any official Jewish body as being officially Jewish, but they um, are one of these called emerging communities. And um, the, the guy who's the spiritual leader of the community, he has um, a certain level of training that he did with the uh, Abayudaya Ugandan community uh, under the supervision of the rabbi there. And so he has a certificate in sort of the introduction to rabbinics, uh, as it's called. And so they're moving forward, and they are committed, these people. Um, so I'm not here to – I'm not – I don't visit any of these communities to be the judge of these people, whether whether they're Jewish or not no, Jewish or, or whatnot. My job is to photograph them and document them as they are, and uh, however the Judaism manifests itself. Over time – if they continue on their present course, uh, just like the Abayudaya have done over their over the, over a century, I don't see personally. I don't see why they can't uh, also eventually have people who in their community who are uh, officially trained and study at yeshiva or other schools and get official training and, and recognition. Yeah, sure. So, but they have a long way to go because they need outside support, not just in that sense, but also just. Um, in materials and, you know, Torah and Sidorim and everything and anything. I mean, they have, uh, and that community has a dedicated synagogue building, um, whereas the community in Cameroon that I also visited just recently, they do not. Um, so it's a little bit of a different story there. But now What do you uh, find about the, the foods, the the, the, the uh, you know, kashrut there, would they be? Uh, this guy I just referred to uh, in Ghana, he has uh, been trained to um, 
in um a shoghet. Shoghet, uh, as uh, to slaughter uh, chickens, he said, but larger animals he has not been trained. So they do have uh, kosher chickens. Um, and, uh, you know, and then they eat other things that are just kosher, so yes. vegeta- vegetarian foods and stuff. Right. So um, I don't think it's too much of an issue for them. Right. So that's Ghana, that's Cameroon. And the other, the DRC now? <laughs> yeah, the DRC. Um, that's, uh, man, you know, that's just a country that you don't really think you're ever going to go to. And then there I was, you know, and, um, it was, it's like the wild west, you know, and it's, uh, I, so I've been there, been there. I can't believe it. I've been in the, been in the DRC. It's, uh, they have a very interesting history, uh, particularly the South part, Lubumbashi. I was only in two places, Lubumbashi, uh, which is the southern capital city of the southern region, and then in Kinshasa. Um, the, the, and they're very, they're historically quite different. Lubumbashi is more tied to uh, the Copper Belt area with other old commun- Jewish communities in Zambia, not far away, in Dola, Kitwe, uh, Luansha, which are, poof, maybe a uh, hundred kilometers away and they're not far. Um, so there's there's quite a difference in sort of the feel and also in the towns. Uh, Lubumbashi is much more relaxed. Kinshasa, you don't really want to just start wandering around town but on your own. Uh, so, you know. Yes. You but know. what did you find in uh, Kinshasa? Uh, well, there's a f- very b- uh, big complex. There's uh, the it's the official uh, community Israelite do the, the Kinshasa. I don't speak French, so I'm, I'm, but uh, um, and they have a whole center there. They've got a which incorporates a synagogue, it has a mikveh, it has, has a classroom. Uh, they have space for functions there. They've got a beautiful inner courtyard which is uh, open to the sky, and they can do functions in sort of inside around the courtyard. Uh, they have their offices there, their official community offices there, and there's also the Chabad there. Now, the Chabad and the community there don't actually – they're actually separate, but they have their offices on the same premises, but they operate independently. Um, the I was amazed uh, to find out long ago before I went that there's a yeshiva in Kinshasa. You know, who would think it, right? But there you go. Um, and there's a man, uh, Rabbi Shlomo Bentalila who has been there with his family uh, since 1991. And he's uh, mid-50s, early 50s. Uh, so he went there, you know, obviously as a much younger man. And uh, his uh, he has a yeshiva, uh, Ohel Moshe. Yeshiva Ohel Moshe, I believe it's called. Um, and he uh, trains eight boys at any given time. They come for about a year. They come from the States, from Canada, from Israel. Um, and they have a, si- a building off-site uh, from of, of the main center there, a few blocks away, where they the boys sleep and they study, uh, and then they use the synagogue in the com- the Kinshasa Jewish community building for uh, for their regular prayers, their, their yes. daily morning evening prayers, and you know all all the prayers. So um, there's a lot going on there. There's yeah. a lot going on, and. It's remarkably busy, and it's uh, it's um, surprising because you just don't sort of put those things together, DRC and, and Judaism yeah. or yeshiva. Correct. So um, very interesting. Um, but you mentioned there the Chabad of there. So yeah. that now then they must have their own little community there as well. I mean, Well, as I say, they, they're they very small in that regard. I mean, there's just this one man who's actually Chabad who's there and his wife and his family. Uh, and then he trains these boys. Um, but there's no other – there isn't really a Chabad community. And I mean, like here in Johannesburg, you've got Correct. many, many people who are affiliated with the Chabad centers. So he's really – in that regard, he's really just a, a one-man show. Um and he is also officiates as the rabbi for the community at large there. You have a lot of uh, Israeli families there, and it's um, I think upwards of 200 or so people uh, who are affiliated and are uh, busy with the community at any one time. Right. But there are a lot of transient people as far right. as I know. So. And then uh, Rwanda. Rwanda, you know – I was looking for uh, any kind of thread, uh, an opportunity to visit any country uh, in Africa for, for my project. And Rwanda is a good example of, of what I'm talking about because there is no Jewish community whatsoever in um, Rwanda. Um, but 
there are two points that I went to photograph. One was the Kigali Genocide Memorial Center, which is um, uh, a whole facility built on the grounds of uh, mass graves of 250,000 people who were slaughtered 20 years ago, uh, just next month. I think it's April 7th is the official anniversary 1994. of 1994. Yeah. And... Um, I wanted to go there because obviously with parallels to the Holocaust, but they also have in their facility there, they have um, exhibits on different genocides around the world over the years. And there is one section, of course, dedicated to the Holocaust. And also in the facility, there are two big stained glass panels, which were um, designed uh, by a the son of a, an Auschwitz survivor. So these were the elements there that I wanted to really capture. The other place that I went to in Rwanda was this, uh, about an hour outside of Kigali, uh, a place called the Agahoso Shalom Youth Village, which was founded about 10 years ago uh, uh, from the vision of a woman named Anne Heyman. And some of you listening, I'm sure, would know her name. She was originally South African, and she spent most of her life in the United States. And she tragically, at age 52, she tragically perished in a horse riding accident at just uh, the end of January, just this past. Terrible, terrible. Uh, she was the one that I was connected to, and I had several emails with her, and she was the one who approved my uh, visit and then passed me on to one of her um, assistants to take it from there. And uh, I didn't expect to meet her. I didn't. She just, she's not based uh, at the center in Rwanda. She's based in New York. But nonetheless, it, I mean, just I was just you know shocked by by that as anybody would be. Um, so I went out there. The center is to, was built to uh, basically to give hope and a life to orphans of the genocide and to other children who are at risk. And and one example of that is. Pe children who might come from a very abusive household, sexual abuse or some other sort of abuse. Um, so not necessarily uh, all orphans. There's 500 kids there, uh, but mainly high school. And then there's a number of staff people. So I, 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 I estimate about 1,000 people, 800 people actually live in this purpose-built village. It's in a magnificent location on these sloping hills. Oh, I mean, all of Rwanda's got sloping hills, but the way the village is laid out and it overlooks these these lakes and it's it's just serene and beautiful and uh i um had a coincidental coincidence of timing with my visit uh one of ann Heyman's uh sons uh just happened to be there he was with a group of young judea uh who came from israel they're there for a year but they came out to rwanda for 3 weeks and when i was uh, there just a week or so ago he was uh, he and the group they were there on their last day and they in the center of the village there's a um, kind of like a gazebo and in, under the gazebo there's a wall that they were painting and they were painting a mural to the memory of his mother mm -hmm. which was very moving and poignant and so i I uh, was able to take some photographs of him uh, fo painting, uh, you know, the years uh, of his mother's life. And so very kind of dramatic in that sense. Uh, very composed young man. He, I have to say he was smiling the whole time. He was joking around with, with his friends that he had made. And, and I was very impressed by him. He's only a, a young guy of 19 uh, and this is very fresh, and so uh, I was very impressed. So anyway, those are the threads that I that I pulled out of Rwanda for my Jewish photo project. We're going to take a break. We're back in a few moments. What's going on in the community? Let's find out with Isaac Resnick. Welcome back. 7.31. It's a Tuesday evening, a lovely evening, Johannesburg. If you've just tuned in. We have with us Jonah David. I'm sure you're finding it very, very fascinating as we are here, Steve and I. It's absolutely fantastic to travel all around the world, to, to explore, to see all these, these different parts and what's, and Judaism all over. Yeah. And then, you know, I'm going to use something with tongue in cheek and please, I hope it's taken the right spirit. If you're looking for Coca Cola, you'll always find Chabad everywhere as well. Wherever there's a Coke, there's a Chabad. <laughs> and I must compliment them. They go into the most, uh, it's unbelievable, exotic places where you think that no one would ever go in. Right. You'll find Chabad there as you well. You will. They do a lot of great work. And they've given me, for my project and my work, yeah, I've gotten a lot of uh, very welcomed and much appreciated support uh, and assistance. Yes. So now you're, we're gonna, you've, you've told us all about Rwanda, the DRC, 
Ghana, uh, Uganda, and now there's Cameroon. Yeah, Cameroon is a fairly similar story to the Ghana community. They're also young, fledgling, not recognized, uh, but getting you know more and more visitors to come. Uh, they're a bit more dispersed. Uh, the community in Ghana is just at one village. The community in Cameroon, they're really spread between three places. Uh, the primary location being a, a village called Sa, which is about an hour uh, outside of Yaoundé, the capital. And they there they have they um, have a the village. Uh, uh, pardon me, not the village um, leader, the community leader. Um, in one of the rooms in the house they have that they use for their functions and their prayers. So it's, uh, in, it's quote unquote a, a synagogue, uh, but not officially as such. Um, and that's where they mainly gather for all their events uh, and holidays. Uh, in Yaounde, there's a few people uh, scattered about, uh, but then also in uh, Douala, uh, a few hours away from there, um, is um, there, there's another, probably the next largest group of uh, the members. And uh, so I think that, you know, because they're so they're spread out and uh, getting around takes time and it's not as easy to uh, get from one point to the other, um, their activities are a bit more... Um, loosely organized, I think. Uh, but again, I, like in Ghana, I think that their heart's in the right place, their um, commitment's in the right place, and uh, with time, they there's no reason that they can't get the training that they need to be officially recognized, even at the um, uh, loosest of levels. Uh, I don't know what word to use there. But uh, yeah, so they have a lot to look forward to as well, and uh, they're welc they're very welcoming to outsiders. They were they were great to me. They did everything possible to accommodate um, my needs to visit and to get photographs, and uh, and uh, yeah, they're they're very very welcoming. And it's a safe environment. I mean, some of these countries, like the DRC, is not like I said. You don't want to go wandering around there. Anybody who's been to the DRC would know, uh, and anybody who hasn't certainly has an image of what the DRC would be like. Um, but I don't, you know, I, certainly the, life is safer and calmer and nicer and friendlier on the ground than it is on CNN. You know what I'm saying? So uh, I don't want to give anybody a false impression, but uh, but but definitely in uh, Cameroon and Ghana, things are, you know, much more calm and, and, and safe to walk around and, and you don't really have to watch your back, so to speak. So uh, that definitely makes a, a visit easier. Right. Have you got any questions for Jonah? You can SMS 34519 or any comments. Please, uh, Jonah will be only too pleased to answer them. Now, uh, Jonah, have you been to Ethiopia at all? No, I haven't. Um, it's it's very high on my list uh, as I get further into my project, as I move now towards the more the northern part of Africa. Um, I've covered pretty much everything I want to cover in the southern region with a few minor exceptions. Um, so, uh, Ethiopia, hopefully next year, you know, some of the places I want to go to, I have to think about the, 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 um, this time of year, the season, because it's either too rainy or too hot. hot yes. Uh, so Ethiopia, I believe is like this time of year. Um, Northern Africa is also this time of year. Um, Madagascar, where there's just a, a very small thing connected to to the Jewish world there, uh, going in August or September is really the time to go. This time of year is the rainy season. So uh, the, the seasons, the climate will dictate a little bit towards how I plan it out. And Uganda? Well, um, I was there in August last year, and, and it was fine. Um, I think going there at really any time of year is, is oak. Is, uh, is, the weather's fairly consistent there, being right. on the equator, so... Now, and you mentioned to me that uh, now you were also now down in the south. You went to um, Botswana and to Swaziland. So tell us about those two. Yeah, places. well, that was back in uh, last August, August and yes. I went on both of those excursions with Rabbi Silverhalf, the traveling rabbi, uh, my point man. Uh, he's been amazing. He's set me up with um, so many contacts throughout all his domain, through basically the southern region of Africa up to Kenya, as far as Kenya. Um, and we did an ex two excursions um, to um, those places. So we went to Swazi for um, uh, to 
We, well, we went to photograph. The, there's two little Jewish cemeteries there. I mean, really tiny. One has about 12 graves. The other has, oh, I think it was three. I opened the one cemetery in, in Swaziland. Yeah. When was that? Uh, it was, I think it was in the late 1990. 1995, uh-huh. 1996. And if you don't mind me asking, what do you mean you opened? Uh, well, you? they were the first Jew to be buried mm. in Swaziland, and we, uh, the, uh, Rabbi myself, went <laughs> down, and we consecrated the ground, okay. and we buried the gentleman. His name was a Mr. Diamond, mm-hmm. so that may remember, um, bring memories to some people. So we went there, but the reason that we were going to Swaziland is because there's a uh, there's a school there's there's a Jewish. Uh, there's a there's a South African man, a black man, who yes, he always comes here. Yeah, yeah Jeff Rumkungadi. Rom, I, yeah. I forgive me, Jeff, if you're listening. Rumkedi. I've just mashed your name. I'm sorry. Right. Uh, and he has a school um, that he opened uh, oh ten or so years ago. It took him many years to build it. Uh, now, ironically, he named the school. Um, with his name, which I won't attempt to pronounce again, I'm sorry, uh, Kobe, as in Kobe, Japan. And he was inspired by or moved by the events of the Kobe earthquake in 1995. Now, I was in that earthquake. I wasn't in Kobe. I was in Osaka. But believe me, it was strong enough. And um, so it was very ironic for me to go to his school and see this name Kobe and have this, this ties to Japan and uh, he's a Jewish man. He converted, and he's very well versed in all things Jewish. And uh, in the school, uh, they were opening a um, Rabbi Silberhaft library, because Rabbi Silberhaft yes. has rounded up hu- like a hundred thousand books, remarkable, uh, from different sources. I think primarily, if I'm not mistaken, from Australia, and. He, we were going to do a, sort of the soft opening of this library that was going to be dedicated under his name. Uh, and I believe later there was an official opening. So we went for that. Um, and, uh, and it was, again, it was, you know, looking for anything that I could photograph, have an excuse to go to Swaziland, which I had been to before. Uh, oh, one other thing. At this, there's a very famous place called Swazi Candles. Many people, I'm sure, know about yes. anybody who goes to Swaziland as a tourist. That's on the tourist route. Swazi Candles. It's also owned, it's owned by a, a Jewish uh, man, family uh, from South Africa. So we went there, and uh, you know. So again, it was just I'm looking for where there's no community per se. I'm I'm looking for any sort of Jewish threads to tie into my overall Africa um, photographic survey project. Uh, and so it was perfect. And uh, traveling with Rabbi Sober so Haft is perfect. Um, Travel in style, you know. So then we went, we came back to Joburg, and a couple of days later, we went the other direction. We went to uh, Botswana, and he was delivering a, a Sefer Torah, the first one that's ever been delivered to Botswana, as far as I understand. And so we went to Khabaroni, and um, we went to the home. There's no synagogue there, but we went to the home of uh, an Israeli family who has lived there for a number of years, and their house has become the sort of the Jewish center. <clears throat> Excuse me, and there uh, was a great celebration and party for the delivery of this uh, of this uh, Sefer Torah. I might mention that uh, the first Jewish cemetery, also in uh, Gaborone, uh, it was also 1994. Rabbi Goldman from the Sydney Mahalas North Shul and myself with Barry K. We also flew there. We also consecrated the first Jewish cemetery and buried the first Jewish person there. His name was Dr. Morris. A Gluck, a Gluckman, a Gluckman, and he was a professor of uh, uh, history, I think it was. He came from England, and he lived in Botswana. And the gentleman that we helped us there, you met you, just also was a chap called uh, Mr. Richard Lyons. Yes. He's uh, an attorney by in proper profession. Yep, yep. He must be in his well in his 80s today. Yes, he's getting on, yes. Oh, but he's on. a very sprightly man, very and he's sprightly. a very interesting character. And uh, he was the advisor to Sir Soretsi Kama, who was the first president of Botswana. You know, in those days it was called Botswana, if you, some of you may remember. Or it was... Uh, it was, uh, or, um, it was um, under the British protectorate, and then they got their independence, and they became Botswana. And uh, his son now, 
He's the advisor to his son as well. And there was a lot of Israelis living there, a lot of South Africans I can mention. There was the, the Gimple family, the two brothers, Jonathan and David. They were architects. So I'm going back a few years, but just for those who are listening in, I'm sure it'll bring back memories as well. Well, the makeup of the community doesn't maybe doesn't seem to have changed that much because there's no. still a lot of South Africans who come and go. Yes. And, uh, I mean, of course, you can drive there as we did in a matter yes. of hours. So you can even, in a pinch, you can do it in one day. Um, and, uh, I mean, there and back in one day. Um, and, yeah, and Israelis. So A lot of Israelis yeah. there because they, there's a very big um, – Diamond industry there, yeah. and that's why the Israelis are there as well. Mm. But they've developed it very well, and very big, and a very good infrastructure in Botswana. Yes, they're having a bit of a, of a boom. It a seems, boom. yeah, Habaroni is really growing. Yeah, it's growing all the time. Mm. Yes. So, uh, what is it? What did you find there? The, you went to the? Did you find? Well, as I said, there wasn't. There isn't a shul there. Yeah. But they use a house. I know that. Yeah. And if the, the cemetery that you mentioned, I didn't get to that. Yeah. Right. Unfortunately, the cemetery so, there mm. is on the outskirts. Uh, as a matter of fact, um, uh, we had two um, South Africans who were judges there. Mm. There was judge, the late Judge Moki uh, Friedman. Many of you remember he was the chairman of the South African Zionist Federation. He was a judge in um, uh, Botswana. And uh, there was a, also advocate Lawrence, um, uh, yeah, Leslie Lawrence. He was there for a while. And there was a, 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 a Horwitz. A judge Horwitz as well. His wife's name was, um, I think it was Hetty Horwitz. I, I may be wrong, but I remember he was there as well. There was a lot of South Africans who, who used to travel, you know, from South Africa to Botswana and, and uh, helped them tremendously there. And it's a very, very stable country, unbelievably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. things are good right now. Things are very good mm. there now. Mm. Now, tell us now, we'll take a break. If you've got any um, questions for Jonah, because we've got a few minutes left, he has to be a, a, another appointment. Um, SMS 34519, we'll be back in a few moments. What's going on in the community? Let's find out with Isaac Resnick. Welcome back, 15 minutes to 8, Tuesday evening. We have in our studios a very, very special guest, Jonah David, and I'm sure we're all fascinated by his travels, going all around the world, photographing pictures of sh shuls, synagogues, temples, etc., and uh, cemeteries. And we've just been talking about Swaziland, Botswana. He spoke about Ghana, Rwanda, Cameroon, and DRC. Now, just, uh, Jonah, to give a background to our listeners uh, what do you plan for the future? What is your... Well, my immediate future is to, over the next two years, which sounds like a long time, but you uh, have to bear in mind I'm not traveling continuously. I travel twice a year. Uh, each trip is six to eight weeks. Um, and I need to do four more, I projected four more of those six to eight week trips to complete uh, my Jewish Africa photographic survey that I'm currently on. Um, so as I said, my, I've covered most of the Southern, uh, region. Uh, I'm now going to turn my sights towards places like Ethiopia and the Northern parts of Africa. Uh, but there are a few places that are going to be tricky. Um, in Nigeria, the biggest concern of course is safety. It's, it's a, not a safe place at all. Uh, I'm hoping something will work out with a group of people, um, that I had hoped to go on this trip, but that did not pan out. Um, and then uh, some places, uh, you know, I would like to go to Egypt, but I think more than the security concern is really um, just getting permission because the community is very tight uh, and getting permission is, uh, is, is I don't know, I, I see how that works out. So I need to find contacts who can really just get me in, uh, open the door there for me. And what about Libya? So, uh, yeah, I'd like to go to Libya. I, I have been in Libya actually in 2003, but um, that was a tourist trip, an archaeological tour, fascinating, not a Jewish thing. Um, so I'd like to go back, um, and I do have a contact there. Uh, so again, it's um, I'm not really particularly concerned in terms of safety in certain certain in those countries. Uh, it's more the logistics of finding the right people. To get me in, get me where I need to go, get the photographs, and then get out. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, uh, that's where – and then Morocco. Morocco's Morocco, huge. Yes. 
Morocco, you could literally spend months and months there. Um, and I'm not going to be able to photograph nearly as much as I originally had hoped, which, you know, there are still today some 200 synagogues, 300 cemeteries scattered around the country. There's no way I can photograph all that on my limited funds. Uh, so I have to think about a plan and what I can do with my resources and still come away with a nice group of photos. So um, that's what I'm looking at in Tunisia, places like this. Uh, there are some places off the coast. Uh, Cape Verde, um, for example, has some old cemeteries, but there's no community life there today. So going to a place like that would be pretty easy, maybe three days in and out. Yeah. So I don't need a lot of time. So I can pick up a lot of ground with a lot of these remaining countries really in a few days. And Algeria? Um, yeah, again, now that's a bit more of a concern uh, you know, safety-wise is, is uh, obviously uh, logistically getting a visa and getting in and finding the right people. I have zero contacts there. So some of these places, there's, there's a fascinating underlying old Jewish history there. I got to get in somehow. Um, so I've sort of left the most difficult part of my uh, mission for, of this Jewish Africa project for the end, um, kind of by design, but also kind of uh, really just because it makes sense. Right. We just got an SMS, but I just need some uh, clarity. Will the book be available to purchase? Marion, could you just let us know what book are you referring to? <laughs> well, I hope she's talking about my future Jew Jews of Africa book, uh, right. uh, which is beautifully printed in my mind. <laughs> and uh, yes, it makes a fabulous gift. Um, I hope to this project will culminate in uh, a nice big fat coffee table style photo book that, uh, that every Jewish household will have. Um, and I, as I said, I anticipate finishing this project in about two years' time, two years from this time of year, so um, two years. And then within 12 to 18 months thereafter to have a book and to have uh, my first exhibitions, uh, which I hope to kick off right here in Johannesburg because I want to do my first exhibition for this project here in Africa, and there's no better place than here in, in Johannesburg. Um, so... Marion is her name. Marion, this is for you. You're going to come to my um, my exhibition, and I will gladly sell you a book. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And uh, one last question, Mozambique. Uh, yeah, I went to Mozambique uh, last a year ago, and this time of year a year ago. Because they rededicated so, the, the synagogue. Yeah, beautifully restored synagogue there. Small but vibrant, expat mainly expat community. Right. Um, very warm, very welcoming. Everybody's great. Everywhere I go, everybody's great. You know, and I get the rock star treatment. And and I, I should just say, you know, that sounds maybe a bit of a joke, but it's it's actually true. And I can't do this work without the help of all those people. Right. You I know? just got an so, SMS yep. from Mariam. Yes. The Africa book. Thanks. Look forward, Marion. Thank you, Marion. <laughs> <laughs> right. So um, it's been a pleasure having you in the studio, Jonah. We look forward to seeing you again. Thank you. But you mentioned Morocco. Yeah. I've got your email. I'm going to send you an unbelievable, fascinating story by the late Chief Rabbi Bernard Casper, who was our Chief Rabbi here from 1963 to 1988. Wow. No, 86, rather. Uh, he passed away in 98. He was in Morocco on a very special mission. And he mentions quite a lot of these uh, old synagogues and how they lived. And you have to read this. It's absolutely vital because it will help you in your research. Okay. I so look that forward all to it. remains you. for me is to thank you for coming in. I'm not chasing you out. I know you have another arrangement. And uh, it's a pleasure being How long in Johannesburg for it all? Uh, well, I'm sort of in the middle of this current visit. I'm here for just about two weeks. But two I was weeks. here. I was, in, I was in and out as I went back and I'll forth to these other countries. I'll be in touch with you in the next day and, or two. Uh, yep. And uh, I can meet with you and help you with the Quite a few things as okay, well. Okay, that's great. I thank you for welcoming me back and uh, appreciate your time and for everybody listening. Right. Thank you. Thank you very well and uh, go well and have a wonderful evening and we'll be in touch. Thank you. Th thank you very much. From Johannesburg to Israel, from sport to business, this is 101.9 High FM. Welcome back. Seven minutes to eight. If you just tuned in, we were talking to Jonah David about his unbelievable visits. He's been to 130 countries throughout the world, taking photographs of old synagogues and cemeteries, etc., visiting Jewish communities in the most remote places that you could ever think of. 
Now, we got an SMS here to ask us, are there no birthdays? Well, I have no birthdays to mention tonight because I read out quite a list last uh, Tuesday evening. But uh, what I can mention is the um, very important yacht site on the 19th of Ardar, and that was Rabbi Joseph Chaim Sonnenfeld. 1848 to 1932, the Rov of Yerushalayim. Now, I also want to mention some historical dates. In 1929, Jewish youth ousted from the Communist Club. That was in Soviet Russia. 1936, Nazi court rebukes plaintiff for using Jewish lawyers. In 1944, 1,400 interned Jewish refugees um, must uh, in Mauritius, colonial minister said they must leave Mauritius, said the colonial minister, and that was a British minister. Uh, 1952, Jewish and Arab standards of living for equal rights in Israel. A bill was passed, 1952. 1969, conservative rabbis agree that Jews... Jewish education needs overhauling to be relevant for the times. So those were some of the things that happened those years ago. Now I just want to mention that um, tomorrow evening at uh, Beis Ametis Ketatora we continue with our series of Godolim We Knew. Remember we've had uh, Rabbi uh, Boruch, Dayan Boruch Rappaport talking about Rabbi Abramski. We have the Rosh Beti and Rabbi Kurtzog talking about Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank, the Rav of Yerushalayim, and also the um, Chazan Ish. And then uh, last week we had um, very, very fascinating uh, Rabbi Tanza, Rosh Hashiva Yeshiva College, talking about Rav Mortal Katz. He was the Rosh Hashiva of Tells. And tomorrow evening we have Rav Boruch Grosnes, the, uh, the Rosh Kolel, talking about Rav Yosef Shlomo Kahaneman, the Pono Vizorov. I'm sure many of you, um, some of you may remember the senior, the older generation. He was in South Africa many times. Uh, he came from Pono built that wonderful yeshiva in uh, B'nai Brak in uh, Israel. And then uh, finally, which will be next Wednesday, the last one will be uh, Rabbi Dayan Baruch Rappaport speaking on Rabbi Yecheskel Sana, the Rosh Yeshiva of Hebron. Eight o'clock tomorrow morning, uh, tomorrow evening. That's at Keta Torah Beis Hamedrash, corner Raglan and Tenth Avenue. That's in uh, Sydenham, not to be missed. And if you have any events that you want me to advertise, or any events, bris mila, weddings, engagements, etc., don't forget you can SMS three four five one nine, or also you can send an email to isaacelchai.co. Dot Z-A. And I also want to mention that that Rashi quiz book is available. Please, if you want to get it and give it as bar mitzvah present, or you're studying or you're learning, it's ideal. It's got a uh, haskoma from Chief Rabbi uh, Dr. Warren Goldstein, perfect for the Shabbos table. There's five volumes uh, available from uh, either the Jewish bookshops, or you can contact me, SMS 34519. Now, don't forget to listen Friday morning, although it's a public holiday, Reflections of the Past, and I'm talking about all the Rabbonim that were in our generation. I've already spoken about Rabbi Rabinovitz, Rabbi Alloy. I'll continue now to talk about Rabbi Rosenzweig, Rabbi uh, Moshe Kay. We'll talk about Rabbi Simonovitz. We'll talk about Rabbi Yesa Kosovsky, Rabbi Michal Kosovsky. And if there's any particular rabbi you want me to talk about, please, you can SMS 34519. So that all remains for me now is to thank uh, Steve for controlling. We've had a fascinating evening. That was a wonderful, wonderful talk by Jonah David. And uh, enjoy the rest of the week. And we'll... I hope you'll tune in on Friday morning, 101.9 High FM.